just form a fucking wall. O'Neal deep in the post, lots of contact there. Oh, what a block by Wallace! What wow. a jump ball! Fifteen down, four, 12-8, 7-38 to play the first one. Oh, first from Rodney, stuck into the rim! Count them, baby, and a foul! Reggie inside for Andre, oh. and a dynamite dunk! Pistons fans, hello and welcome to another edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast. Brendan Johnson, Aaron Johnson, and Ryan Pay all here with you again this week. And boys, our Detroit Pistons, they're on a little bit of a roll. Winners of two in a row. And actually, this is terrible, but for the Pistons, not terrible. Four out of their last ten. Oh my goodness. <laughs> As we start talking Pistons basketball, we talk about the current win streak. We'll get into it in a second, but before that... Just a little check in. How we doing tonight? How we uh, how we feeling about these Pistons? We're on a little bit of a roll. I'm doing good. Uh, you know, good good week. Excited for this podcast as always. Going to be a good show. You know, we're we're bringing it every week here. Yeah, just happy to be here, boys, with my friends, all of you, not these <laughs> two. I'm sitting with. <laughs> uh, wow, yikes! Well, I'm oh, going to be yikes. I'm oh. going to be positive. Bullet to the heart. Seriously, <laughs> ouch, dagger, but. It was hitting Dagger, Sekou Dumbuya, as those Detroit Pistons are on a little bit of a roll up to 16-27 and 27 on the season, finding themselves ninth in the Eastern Conference, still three games out of the playoffs, and winners of two in a row, four out of their last ten, and are things starting to turn for Detroit? Can this team, will this team, even should this team, find a way to make the playoffs here in 2020? I mean, that's a loaded question. You know, we've seen uh, some better play from the Pistons as of late. Again, two in a row uh, for them with wins against the Celtics, minus Jason Tatum and the Atlanta Hawks, So I think it's kind of hard to lose to <laughs> rather than beat. Um, you know, it's two games, and I feel like a lot of talking on Twitter has kind of shifted to, oh, they should try to make the playoffs with these young kids. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to go out and say that that would be a terrible thing. Because I think it would be good for Luke to get back into the playoffs. Seku, you know, those young guys on the roster. But in a weak draft, it's important that if you're a losing team, you get the best pick possible, you know, for what you can get to. And that would be doing the opposite. So you kind of have to weigh those two options. You know, do you try to win as many games as you can? Or, you know, do you lose? And for the Pistons, they're kind of stuck uh, stuck in the middle right now because they're playing the young kids and they're winning. And it's only been two games, so I don't expect that to continue, especially again, considering the caliber of teams that they've played against. Um, but, I, you know, I don't see what else they can do to necessarily quote-unquote tank when Sekou's starting, Svi's getting a bunch of minutes. Um, you know, these young guys are getting those minutes. The only thing that you really could do to try to solidify that you're trying to lose is trade Derrick Rose, is trade Langston Galloway, trade Andre Drummond, trade those, you know, some, old, some of those older players on your roster. But for what the Pistons are doing right now, you know, they're playing a lot of the young kids, and, and recently they found a couple wins. I don't know if you can ask them to do anything else outside of that. These last two games, something that's really stood out is the play of Markeith Morris. Is that someone else Detroit would need to move on if they want to go in the yes. tanking direction? Because, see, he seems to have found his flow a little bit here. It's one of those things where you hate to root against the young guys in a sense of Sekou's going in, he's playing well, and they're winning. And again, right, it's only two games. It's not like they're on this massive streak and they've turned the season around. But they're starting to even just play more competitive in the games they're losing. Sekou is playing well. You mentioned Svi getting a lot of minutes. You want to see Sekou have success, but you also want to see Detroit be in the best draft position possible. And it's kind of a catch-22 because I don't want the Pistons to be the eight seed and get swept out of the playoffs again by Milwaukee. That's not exciting to me. But if Detroit were to go in and and say, hey, listen, there's not a market for Dre. We're holding on to him. Maybe we can move a piece like a Langston or a Markeith, and they still continue to find a way to be competitive and win you know, a fair chunk of games. I'm not going to be mad at Sehu going out and playing well. I am going to be mad if they buy 
for a short-term push to the playoffs for this year. That will piss me off. Absolutely. I think with Blake Griffin being out for the year, I don't think we're going to see that. No matter I'd what. Agree. I mean, unless unless the Pistons went on like a 15-game win streak right here, which obviously the trade deadline is before that, so it would be earlier than that. Like what? A six, seven six game games. win streak. You it's know? about six games. They have probably eight to nine eight games. To nine. February All 6th. Right. So let's say they win four more in a row. They're on a six-game streak. Are they starting to pick up the phone saying, hey, we're trying to buy? I don't think they should be I don't, either I still way. don't think so. I think it's right up to the deadline. I, I think they they go on. Let's say it's nine games. I don't know what it is, and that's bad for the pod, but let's say it's nine games. Let's say they go eight out of nine. Then I'm concerned. Anything less than that, I don't think they do. I don't think they should in general. They could win every single game up until the deadline, and it would still be a bad decision. Their mindset right now, if they you know want to try to you know win as many games as they can this year, should be do it with the roster that you have, because selling assets for short term gain would just be a mind numbing decision. It, and I don't think Ed Stefanski would do that. It just keeps us in the middle. That's all that yeah. does. And I don't think he would do that. I think he's shown some very, um, you know. He's shown a lot of tact. Yes, exactly. So I, I wouldn't expect that. And I think it's important for Detroit to stand pat in the sense of we're not going to buy. We might sell. And that's kind of what I, I think Detroit should do. Even if they want to try to win this year, fine. So be it. But do what you did last year when they traded Reggie Bullock and got Svima Luke and got that second round pick. Do that again with your bro- with your role players. Markeith Morris. Langston Galway, at least those two guys, get what you can. Even if you only are able to get back a couple second-round picks uh, and maybe you get a young player, fine. You take a flyer on someone, do it. Get those assets. It it will make things easier for you down the line if you want to make a move. I get they're not flashy assets, but second-round picks, you come draft night, a team will come calling. A team will want a second round pick, mm-hmm. and that's where you'll be, you will be able to get two second round picks in the future. And you just, that's how you build assets. Second round picks in this league, for some reason, right now, are just like gold. they're hot. They're, they're valuable. They're just hot. They're valuable. Teams want them. It helps them make future moves, it helps them make moves in the current, uh, at their current state of affairs. Second round picks are hot. Getting those assets, I'm all for it. Moving on from Langston. Moving on from Markeith Morse, getting what you can from them. I'm still on the boat of trade Andre if you can. If there is some market. I know the market all of a sudden seems to be just be crashing through the floor right now. But I'm if you can get a fair deal, I'm for that still as well. Can I can I offer something to the pod? We talk about could, would, should. What I want to do is I want to talk about the Pistons' upcoming schedule leading up to this trade deadline. So maybe we could take a continued look at what they should do. They play over 10 games before the deadline. Washington, Sacramento, Memphis, or uh, Brooklyn, Cleveland, and then Brooklyn again. That's their next six games. Boys, if the Pistons played well, they can win all six of those games, which would put them on an eight-game win streak. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying, what if? Then you have Toronto and Denver. Let's just say they're both losses. But then you get Memphis, Phoenix, and the deadline. Of those ten games, if the Pistons win six or seven of them, are they going to be thinking about buying? Because they'll they'll play Phoenix on the 5th, and they have no game on the 6th. They win that night in Phoenix. Let's say they win 7 out of 10, which really makes it 9 out of 12 for the deadline. Are they picking up the phone? One. Should they pick up the phone? What's the cutoff? One. Well, I, I mean, I'm going to stand pat in. I don't care what they win. They should not be picking up the phone to buy. One. That's they get above 500. Happen. Actually, they would be one. If they're 16, 27, the best they could do is one game below 500. It's not going to happen either way. You know, they're going to be playing Memphis, who is one of the hottest teams in the NBA right now. Um, 
you know, Brooklyn is going to be tough for them because they've gotten Kyrie Irving back, and I get that they have not been playing well lately, but anytime you have a player like Kyrie Irving on the floor, you have a chance. They also just got Karis Levert back a few weeks ago as well. So they've gotten healthier. It's taking obviously taking them some yeah. time to figure things out. They've lost 8 out of 10. Yeah, I get it. They have not played well, but they're still, you know, the Pistons have not played that well. They're, they're, they've won two in a row. They're four and six in the last ten. That's not some great statistic. That's not some uh, indicator that this is a hot team right now. These next six games are for a team hopeful to be winning and hopeful of the playoffs. Very important. Right. Uh, but, it's one, it's not going to happen where they, they go out and win the, all these next six games. They've already lost to Cleveland this year. They've already lost to Washington this year. Memphis is, you know, uh, the, like I said, the hottest team in the NBA. And Brooklyn has a chance every night because they have a superstar. So there's just no no sequence, no record that makes me feel the Pistons should go out and buy at the deadline. I will, n- much like you, Aaron, I will not budge from my stance of I want. I'm ready for the future. I'm not here for the buying at the deadline for the now. We ha- Seiko has proven thus far, it's still early, that, hey, this kid's got something here. And he's ready now, in a sense, way more than we thought he'd be. He's much further along, sure. But he is the future. He's only 19. I'm here for the future and for the kids, not for making moves for now. So... There's no situation. None. For me, no. There's not. And you know what? I enjoy watching him play. I love watching him play, and I wish this team was better and healthy because Derrick Rose is such an X factor right now that I feel like he's going to carry them to some wins here that are, in a sense, going to hurt the tank, even though it's not a tank. It's just a rebuild and a retool. I think he's going to be an X factor. And when he's playing at his MVP level with less minutes. That's he's true. He's awesome. Oh, he's been phenomenal. He is awesome. So, you know, so okay, so you're both in a stance of listen, it's not it's not happening. Don't want it. There's no situation. I think it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next six games. Does the mindset change? Does the mindset change? Seiku continues to go off. Oh man, if Detroit had this piece. I don't know. Just something to think about. Um Okay. It's just something to think about. What are you selling then if you're doing a buy now move? What are you selling? Are you are you trading Svi right now? Are you parting ways with him? Well, that's a fair question. Are you trading Luke? No. Okay, do you want to make a move? Are you trading Seku? What are you doing here? Well, what are we talking about? Are, Why would Okay, I'm sorry. Now it's got, like so, it's not you Brendan, but yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. mad now thinking about it. I'm mad now thinking about this. We have pieces that we love. The younger guys that we enjoy watching. And if we're going to make a trade now move, we're going to have to get rid of some of them. So here's right. my question. Instead of watching them here's continue to flourish and grow together. It's considered a weak draft class, right? Every year we hear it's a weak draft class. But, so, but sure, we're talking it's a about, weak draft But class. we're talking about the value of picking high. Well, let's say Detroit goes out and they win seven, eight games here before the deadline. And they go, okay, we want to buy. Well, our first round pick's not going to be that valuable. We're going to be picking 17, 18, 19. Let's part ways with it. What if they part ways with the first round pick in an effort to uh, try to make a push for higher than the eighth seed? It would be a terrible, terrible decision. And it would be an anomaly. Anonymi- oh, God, I'm not, I'm not able to say the word. Anomaly? Be, yes, that of the front office in terms of what they've done throughout their tenure so far. What, what what is that a guaranteed? Not you know considering what the return is. I think so because again, if it's not that valuable of a pick, then you're not you going to get that more to valuable it. player in return. Valuable, I, I, I it's another topic for another time. I'm just I've already devil's got devil's advocate. I just I've already. Advocate. I know we already have our topics, but now bringing it into hey, well you never know. I can't leave it at that. All right. If we love these younger guys on this team so much and we want to see them succeed together and grow together, but then also we're going to make a win now move, that means you have to part way with assets. That's your first round pick, and then that's Svi, or that's, you know, Luke. That's. What if it's like, your first. What are you doing? What if it's your first round pick and Bruce Brown for an asset that you see could help your team going forward? No. 
It no. Just to, I just am throwing out hypothetical. Help, help you going forward. How? Maybe just maybe just maybe you win a first round series. Maybe I can't. I'm tired of. And that. I don't even. I'm tired I don't even that. think you get that good of a piece. You may not. I don't think so either. I mean, you're already you're you're not really. I mean, your hope is if you were to go out and really play well the rest of the year, you what you finish what fifth, sixth at best. Mm-hmm. You're not winning the series with a fifth or sixth seed. You're not beating a Boston. Well, let's say Detroit thinks Reggie Jackson's going to come back and he's going to play this year. Is uh, let's just say they decide, you know what? Let's let's move Bruce. We've got D Rose, who I want to talk about this. He started the last two games. Detroit's won the last two games. You know what if? What if that happens? Okay, let's move on from Bruce. Let's continue the Reggie train. You know they say he's due back very soon. Does he have a place? It's 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 a tough thing to analyze. I would say with with where the team is at right now, I think his role is pretty minimal. I, I mean. He gets what the Tim Frazier minutes right now. Does he take some of Bruce's minutes at point guard? Then so he falls Jackson, out of the rotation. Reggie Jackson just falls to the bottom of the mix. I no I'm not no saying he'll he... get a role somewhere. I just I don't I just don't know where because that's what a, this team okay. has right now is a lot of guards. Does the team say Tim, hey Tim Frazier's minutes aren't promised? You we see. Very clearly, Tim Frazier's minutes are very fluid depending on how he's doing. Mm-hmm. So those minutes aren't just a guaranteed 20 a night for Reggie Jackson. Here you go. So those are very wishy-washy minutes. So that means we're going to be taking minutes away from Bruce at point. We're going to be taking minutes away from Svi maybe. Because you know Dwayne Casey loves Langston Galloway. What if there's something that comes about where you get a valuable asset for your first-round pick and a team that goes, man, we need a point guard. Let's take a chance on Reggie Jackson. <laughs> I don't think that's plausible. I don't think that's. You don't think scenario. it's plausible? No, no, no one is taking Reggie Jackson. I just don't. This, I don't the dude think hasn't that's been real. on the court since the second game of the year. He's getting paid sixteen million dollars. If you attached a first round pick to it, <clears throat> somebody that was desperate for a backup point guard. But you're getting an asset back, so that just doesn't add it up. It doesn't add up. Maybe it's a it's it's a flyer that you take a chance on being an asset. No, greater I, no one's no not. one's touching Reggie Jackson. I think that's, I think that's pretty apparent. I think if there was a trade for Reggie Jackson to be had, it would have already been made. If you're parting with your first round pick, that means you're making a move to get better, not you're taking a flyer on somebody. It doesn't work. It's I don't know. Fair it enough. Doesn't work for me. So what's Reggie's role when he comes back? What's his what 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 if it was your choice? His role is he's got nothing. You stuff him at the end of the bench, or does he have a spot? I think. The team is going to try to find him a spot. Again, it's those Tim Frazier minutes here and there. Uh, I think he's going to take some minutes from Bruce. I think you're going to see some of Svee's minutes decline. I just don't see a realm where Reggie Jackson comes back healthy and isn't in the rotation. With, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. Go ahead, Aaron. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll finish I'll finish up quickly so then you can give your point. But especially with the way the team has talked about he's coming back soon. He's coming back soon. It's not a, it's not a well, we might just... Let him rest the rest of the year. Be healthy going into you know free agency for him. They obviously seem to have a plan for him to come back here, and I think that means some of those young guys lose lose some minutes. I also think that it takes a few minutes away from Derrick Rose as well, because especially as of late, he's been playing a tad more than you would like, considering uh, you know the minutes restriction that the Pistons try to hold him to. So I, I definitely think that he's going to get minutes. Um, I think it means you're going to see some more Bruce at the two. Uh, it's a little bit of less Derrick Rose, maybe a little bit less V. But Reggie's going to have a spot in the rotation. Ideally, Detroit has to move Langston Galloway for that to really work out. Yes, and I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. You take all the time you need to finish your point. <laughs> it just it's another hey, thing that you gets you enjoy like having your fun over here. Like I don't want to interrupt. It's anything, just you know? another thing that gets me animated about we need. My focus is on the future. There's some exciting young pieces. And with Reggie Jackson coming back, the Dwayne Casey we know, his track record suggests Reggie Jackson's coming back and being in the starting lineup. That's the Dwayne Casey we know. Yeah. That's what his track record suggests. Maybe not the first game but, to get Reggie but by acclimated like the third again, or fourth. but he will be back in that starting lineup because that – is the Dwayne Casey I feel that we all know, yep. and that has been his track record. How long did it? We said it would take what? That excuse me. 
I'm so animated. I'm tripping over my words right now. Ryan came here tonight to ready talk. to go. I came ready to go. I'm juiced. I'm fired up. We talked about in the beginning of the year how it was going to take some time to get Thon out of the rotation, but he was going to play his way out, right? Right. But it took way too long. Right. Because Dwayne Casey is stubborn with his guys. And I get Reggie Jackson was here before Dwayne Casey was here. But he's he's gone with Reggie Jackson. He's rode that train. He's going to put him back in the starting lineup. That's what his track record suggests. He is loyal. Right. He is loyal. He is loyal. So then, He's going to put him in that starting lineup. So Bruce falls out of the starting lineup, or Luke falls out of the starting lineup, if or Luke, Thon falls out of the Or not Thon. Thon. I mean, Tony Thon's Snell. Not Thon. Met Tony <laughs> Snell. Totally met Tony Snell. Still, just, is it, it's likely Bruce. It's Bruce. It's, it's Bruce. It's but not Luke. It's definitely it not Luke. It better not be Luke. Luke. It can't be Luke. It can't be. No. Oh, my goodness. If it's Luke. If it's Luke, I'm done. Send him, send the send, send the team to Seattle. I couldn't blame you. Send them to, send them to Seattle. Um, I will buy that ticket. <laughs> but I think what you're looking at when Reggie Jackson comes back, if I was running the Pistons, what I would do is I would put him on a 15-minute per game minute restriction. He would come off the bench and play two you know, seven, eight minute spurts, and, and that would be it for him the rest of the season. Uh, unless, you know, towards the end of the year, you're winning a lot, and he's a big part of that, and then you want to uptick his minutes. But look, I'm, I, I think everyone that's listened to this podcast, everyone that's followed me on Twitter, everyone that's read my work about him knows that I believe Reggie Jackson is a good basketball player when he's healthy. I think everyone knows how much throughout the years I've defended his you name. You stuck by Reggie Jackson. And, and the Aaron Johnson that we know, Ryan, will continue to defend Reggie Jackson. He's still defending Stanley Johnson. He let still alone is. Reggie Jackson. <laughs> It's like it's like he's paying on that Stanley contract for like the next six I'm years. Right. I'm one of his the, loyalty. He's like Owen for like six more years off the books. I'm one of the shareholders on his contract, yeah, actually. Is. So seriously, he was a ground floor <laughs> investor. With us. Seriously, but I think I think you know, give him that opportunity to play a little bit. Let's see what value he has for the rest of the season, uh, and you know, obviously going into the off season where he's an unrestricted free agent. But don't tarnish your your future. Don't. Put Bruce Brown to the bench. Don't put Svee to the bench. Don't limit those guys. Let them continue to grow, as Ryan talked about. I do want to see Reggie Jackson play because I know Reggie Jackson's a good basketball player. And what has happened? I, I what has happened to Reggie Jackson in his tenure in Detroit is just so unfortunate. It's a travesty. It really is, considering how he came here, the way he played when he got here, his first full season when he was phenomenal borderline all-star and helped lead the Pistons to the playoffs and then the injuries it's so so unfortunate and there's been so many people that have slandered him as a basketball player that are so far off base just because he could not stay healthy there was no denying that whenever Reggie Jackson was healthy the Pistons were a better basketball team with him on the floor they won games when Reggie Jackson was healthy it's really unfortunate the way it's gone down with his tenure. Mm-hmm. At that same time, when he returns, he should be on a minutes restriction coming off the bench the rest of the season. Fair, but we both we all know that won't happen. It, that might be a first week back thing. Get him, you know, get him back, get him into his first few games on a minute restriction, get him on the floor. I agree with you though, Ryan. Reggie is going to find his way back to the starting lineup because that's the, the Dwayne Casey we know. Dwayne Casey's going to be loyal to those guys. He's going to give Reggie his chance to be the starter. And, and you know what? He knows that, okay, if I start Reggie and it goes really well, well, then maybe we consider another one-year deal with Reggie and seeing what can happen if he can stay healthy. Maybe we make a push to the playoffs. Maybe that helps me look like, hey, yeah, we are developing as a team. If it goes really bad, then it opens up the, okay, we're done with Reggie. We move on, and, and, and whatever. I expect him to return to that starting lineup, and I expect it to affect, as Aaron mentioned, both Bruce and Derrick Rose's minutes. But there was something, Aaron, you said there when talking about Reggie, that makes me want to kind of switch our topic just a little bit. Unless, if you want to add something, I just quick. have something real quick to add. I like Aaron's point about the fifteen-minute, seven-eight-minute spurts. Minutes restriction, and it's no ill will against Reggie Jackson. I agree. And really, the one good year we got to see him be fully healthy and fully functional, 
He was a borderline all-star, and he was a very good player. He is not some locker room cancer. He's the only guy you ever see when they're injured who's always with the team. He's a, He was a very good player. There's nothing wrong with Reggie Jackson. I have no ill will towards Reggie Jackson, mm-hmm. but it's just time. When you see guys like Svi playing the way he's playing, is he the greatest basketball player on the planet? Very well and could you're be. asking, <laughs> Jesus, he is on fire right now. Bruce is developing very well, and we need to see him keep developing at point guard. You know, Luke needs to have his minutes. Seku needs Like, these young guys just need their minutes right now. They need to grow. It's their time to learn. Yeah. It's, just, it's no ill will on Reggie. It's just time. Well, it's time for a change of the guard. And the other thing is, and this is kind of what I wanted to switch to here, Derrick Rose has scored at least 20 points in each of his last eight games. Derrick Rose has willed the Pistons to competitive play and wins you know, in their last two consecutive games. He's having a borderline all-star season. And when, Aaron, you said borderline all-star referring to Reggie's first year here in Detroit, it just made me think, D. Rose is having a pretty incredible season. And, I mean, he's putting up numbers like he was in his MVP seasons early in Chicago. Does Derrick Rose deserve to be an all-star in 2020? Derrick Rose has made me eat each and every single one of my words from the summer. Hell yeah, he has. When I criticized that signing, I I truly felt that it was a bad signing. But he has made me eat my words. And for that, I'm able to admit it. He has been fantastic this year. He's getting to the cup. He's finishing at a phenomenal rate. Again, the shooting has died down. That was one thing I was right on, was he is not a supreme three-point shooter. I was right about that. But in general, he's made me eat my words. He's been great. Uh, You know, obviously, some of his late-game antics, I'm still not a fan of. Some of his decision-making with the basketball, I'm still not a fan of. But there's no questioning that when he is on the court, the Pistons are a better team. He brings a completely different dynamic to the offense because he's the only guy on the roster that's healthy right now that's capable of going and getting a bucket. He has been effective, efficient, uh, energetic, exciting. He's been great. That being said, I don't think he deserves to be on the All-Star team this year. He's coming off the bench. Obviously, he started the last two games, and I do think that going forward that should continue um if there was you know for some reason why Derek wasn't starting I thought you know it was said that Derek needs to come off the bench for his health and for his minutes restriction but all of a sudden that's been thrown out the water that doesn't exist anymore it seems like uh and and if that was the case Derek should have been starting quite some time ago but I think when you look at his resume and you see well he's been coming off the bench all season um, and he has missed some time. There are some other players that, that start and are on better teams, like a Chris Middleton. Um, you know, that maybe that team already has one all star, but he, he, he doesn't deserve an all star candidacy over them. And I don't want that to be taken as a slight at what Rose has done this year, because again, he's been a very good player for the Pistons. But at the end of the day, when you have as poor of a record as Detroit does, and you've come off the bench for, you know, basically all season, he's only started three games this year. It's going to be very hard to get onto an All Star roster. How do his numbers compare this season compared to uh, his MVP year per thirty six? They're pretty close, right? They're pretty close, right? Pretty close. This year, just for for point's sake. Uh, averaging 18.3 points a game, 5.9 assists per game, uh, 2.4 rebounds per game. That's over just over 22 minutes, nearly 23 minutes a game, and he's averaging uh, 2.6 turnovers per game, which is less than his career average of 2.7. So he's almost averaging a point a minute. So this guy's electric, <coughs> and I get he's been coming off the bench, but he's been playing at a level very similar. To his MVP year, mm-hmm. it's he's ki- yes. Granted, the Pistons aren't very good, and Andre Drummond has been helping him, but he's been carrying the Pistons on his back for quite a bit now. A lot of what he's doing, and I get it doesn't 
show necessarily a lot in the win-loss column, but this team would be much worse without him. Oh, yeah. Much worse without him. And I get all-star nods and awards and all that good stuff go to players who have who are on good teams. Their play leads to great success for a team, and I get all of that. But the way he is playing right now, I don't see how you can deny him an all-star nod. He's playing like an all-star. He really He's is. He's playing like one of the better players in the league right now. His caliber of play is definitely but, up there. But who does he get in over? <clears throat> that's that's the question for me. Who does he deserve that nod over? Out of all the candidates in the Eastern Conference, you bring that roster down to 15, who who is he better than You know, of that group? That's the challenge that I find in getting him on that roster. Who are some last two roster spot candidates? In your opinion. You're probably looking at Sabonis uh, from the Pacers. Okay. Jalen Brown. Uh, I, I think Bam out of bio has been good enough to get it, but maybe he's still towards the back end. Uh, I think because of record, you know, the Hawks have been so bad this year. Trey Young individually has been an all-star, but I think record is something that, even if it shouldn't be, is taken into account. He's on that back end of guys that, you know, maybe could be an all-star. Um Spencer Dinwiddie, you know, the list could go on and on, but I, I, I think p- getting him through is it's just a the tough challenge. The only name on that list that was like, no, probably not, was Jalen Brown. I can see him I over Sabonis. Trey Young, that's iffy, I get it, but that team is so bad. Um, Dinwiddie, over him. I, I, I'm reading something. And, and I know the list can keep going and going, but I don't know. He is... He's playing like he deserves it, if you ask me. He's been great. Again, like, he's been great. And I'm not, like, does not me I know like, it's holding not a vendetta or anything like that? Derrick Rose has been really good. I just don't know if there's anyone I could put him in the All-Star game over. It, it's really tough for me to look at the list of guys that are All-Star candidates, quote-unquote, and find a way that Derrick Rose fits into that top 15. Now, if they wanted to do, you know... Oh, it's in Chicago this year. Let's bring in a couple Chicago legends. And Derrick Rose gets like a legend spot. Kind of like how they did it for Dirk and uh, Wade last year. I, I mean, great. But I don't know if I can get him in that top 15. I really think he's on the on that bubble on the, look at, on the outside looking in. I mean, it's a fair point. And I, the argument can be had either way. It's not like, oh, he's definitely an all-star. Oh, he's definitely not an all-star. Right. I, I agree. It's like... There's a lot of middle of ground here. There's a lot of gray area. But to me, and it's not me trying to be a homer with the Pistons, because if I'll be the first one to be tough on and be like, no, absolutely do not put that person in. But Derrick Rose, his level of play, his efficiency, what he has meant to this team, even though it's still not a great team, it's very all-star level caliber. If Rose, had, Even if they were in the same spot record-wise, if Rose had been starting... Even the last 15, 20 games, you know, I, I feel like it's uh, a little bit more attainable. It's tough. I mean, reading things, I mean, he's not even, he's he's off a lot of even radar. Yeah, I know. Yeah, he's sure not he even is. considered it's, a snub. He, right. He's just not even in the mix. I think a lot of people look at the fact that he's coming off the bench. He's only averaging 22, 23 minutes per game. And I think. But what is he doing in those 22 minutes? I, guess. I agree. I agree. It, it doesn't matter if you come off the bench. To, it honestly it doesn't to me. No. If you're putting up numbers coming off the bench, who cares? Who cares? Right. And I get he's only playing the 22 minutes, but what is he doing with those 22 minutes? Manu Ginobili. There you go. I know that's just one example, but there you go. Said to put it out there. Is he, if, if the Pistons had an all-star, is he your all-star over Drummond? Probably. Oh, that's tough. Dre is the league's leading rebounder, but that's still uh, to me. It just, I don't know. It just doesn't like. I think it Drummond, doesn't mean that much. I think to if me. you looked at people being considered for the All Star game, I think Drummond is on the, on people's radar he is. more than oh, Rose definitely. is. I, I, definitely. Reading several things where Dre is considered a snub. A lot of people have Sabonis from Indiana making it over him as kind of like the last reserve. You know. Post but if, if if you were able to pick one representative from the Pistons, Derrick Rose, I would. I, I wouldn't even. It doesn't take me anything to think about it. I think Derrick Rose. It's it's not because easy Ryan, your, your point is so just spot on. With listen, who cares if he's only playing twenty three minutes a game? What is he doing in those twenty three minutes? And how is it affecting his team? 
It's been only mostly, like, only really positive. And it's especially because Derrick Rose is a guy, it's like, hey, he's not coming in and having a crazy second quarter and then kind of disappearing. The dude's hitting big buckets down the stretch in the fourth quarter. Do- guys having dominant stretches again, like he did pre-injuries. Dominant stretches of games. Where it's just like, this is a clown show. No one can even look at him right now. It's almost it's- like you go back to his contract he signed in the offseason, and it's almost like, damn, I wish this was a four-year deal. This is a great value contract right now, the way he's playing. See for me, Aaron, it's, go on. It's it's for me. It's a little tough. <sighs> Bring the, no, no, I agree. It is. It's not a oh no problem like Brendan said. But I don't. I throughout this talking about it, I talked myself into Derrick Rose. We have spent the last almost month talking about how Dre has disappeared. Talking about Dre started hot and then is you know kind of just withered off. And hey, he's not like he's been bad, but he has definitely not been great. He's not been what he was the first ten games of the year. It's a no brainer to me. I'm just Sorry. looking at the statistics. 18 points, 17 Don't rebounds, let the stats lie three you. assists, Don't let two the stats steals, lie you. two blocks. Those Don't. That's a pretty good resume right there. I, I know, but Drummond has been a stat padder his whole career. Don't let that's the, not stat padding. Get out of don't here. Don't let the stats. Don't start that. The whole, the whole like, we can go 17 40 minutes on that if you want game, to. The whole 17 rebounds a game, just don't give me that. Can we just take a slight twist on this topic real quick, sticking with Andre Drummond? Since the trade talk started, does he appear to to be off? Am I wrong in saying he appears to be off in his play since the trade talk started? No. I don't think you're necessarily wrong. I'm not saying he's, I'm not saying, oh, he's moping. God, I hate him. Not any of that. No, but he, he wants... just appears to be a little off since the trade talks. Am I Am I crazy here? And, and, and you kind of wonder, is it because he wants to be in Detroit for the long term? And that idea of having to go elsewhere and not be the figurehead he is in Detroit maybe concerns him? Is that a real thing? Is that a thing where this franchise is stuck by Dre for a long time and now all of a sudden all these reports are out that Detroit is engaging in trade talks and you know, Gore has just been on record saying they're gonna stick by Drummond, they're gonna build with Drummond, they're gonna you know, he he is kind of the face of the franchise, if you will, and he he's watching a young guy in Seiku emerge and he's watching his name get thrown around and people saying, Yeah, trade him. Like Ah, that, hell, that would throw me off. I, I mean, how does it not? You've been somewhere for the first seven, eight years of your career, and then all of a sudden, you've had a you, you've been pretty stable. You've not really been a, considered a trade target, and now all of a sudden, you're being taught your name's being tossed around seven, eight, nine teams. Yeah, where how are you does that go? not? How does it not kind of get in your head a little bit? Might it be in Atlanta, New York? Not only that, not just that there's trade talk, but also that teams in throughout the league don't necessarily find him valuable. How is that playing with his psyche? Right. These reports coming out that teams don't really want teams rather take their chance in free agency rather than part way with any asset to get him because they're not in any rush to get him. They'll take their chances in free agency. Is that playing with his psyche a little bit? See, that's where I think it's. I think that's a a mistake of the team. Uh, you know, the team's looking at Drummond because. Drummond is certainly of value. Drummond certainly does things that would help a team win ball games this year. I agree. And that's what I'm saying. Is that getting in his head that he thought, like, I do bring a lot of value and I am a high-level player, and all of a sudden he's seeing these teams don't think that, and now he's kind of, what? Wait, wait a minute. He's questioning himself on top of the report that came out about how he thinks he's a max player, yet the Pistons offered significantly less. How much is this is just messing with his psyche right now? It, it, it's got to be killing I think it's getting to him pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah, he put up 16 and 17 or whatever against Atlanta, but he still did not seem right. And that's why those stats That's why those stats don't like speak the world to me. It's impressive. Don't get me wrong. Averaging 18 and 17 is very impressive. And his blocks and his steals, and he does some things. I'm not trying to take that away. I'm not saying... Yeah, I'm not trying to negate what he provides on the floor, but... You know, it, it, it's just. I mean, Dre's even on record talking about. I, I saw somewhere he was, you know, talking. I think it was Reggie when he first got to town, going in and maybe taking a couple of Dre's rebounds. And he looked at him. He's like, "Hey, you don't do that. That's my rebound. That's what I get paid to do. I get paid to clean up the glass. Don't come take my boards. 
You get out of the way, you let me grab that rebound. That's why I get paid. You know? So he kind of lives by that. And, and it's not as impressive as maybe the number shows. What I want to say in kind of conclusion of that, though, is I agree with your point of Dre provides value to a team. Dre can provide value to this Detroit Pistons team. If Dre's here for the long term, which is not necessarily how I want to see the long term plan go, but if he is, Dre can continue to provide value. Dre playing the five with Seiko as the four going forward can be can work. I don't think it fits the right timeline. Thus, if Detroit really reshapes where they're headed, or if they say, man, with Seku playing at this level, we make a little accusation in the offseason, maybe we really are not far away from trying to compete at a higher level. If D. Rose is going to be an all-star level point guard, I, I, I guess it just depends the way they see their future at the end of this season. Um, but, I don't know, Dre's a weird topic. It's, it's it's got weird. me rambling. I, I just don't even know. Yeah, we've really know gone off on a going. tangent, uh, kind of hitting everywhere here. But that's kind of what Drummond has done lately in terms of the talk around him. There's so many things going on with him. It's the contract extension, moving into trade talk, moving into all he still wants to be a piston, and all of these different things have just kind of made it really hard to talk about Drummond in a straight line. And you know. I, whether the Pistons keep him or not, he's a valuable player. I think it gets a little bit tricky for Detroit to keep him when they're playing Sekou at the four, and Sekou's playing well at the four. You're still committed to Blake Griffin for another two years. I think it gets hard to do that unless you're positive Sekou can be a three, and you're going to start finding minutes for him at the three to make sure of that. Um, but Truman is a good basketball player. And for these teams in the playoffs right now, not trading for Drummond is a terrible decision. I look at a team like Boston, and I know I talked about this on the podcast a few weeks ago, but I have two forwards in Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown that are really figuring it out. Tatum and Brown have been fantastic. But they have Gordon Hayward, who's a forward, a former All-Star. He has the resume. He has all that, that that pedigree where he deserves to be starting as well. And you have three forwards in your lineup. You don't need three of them. You really need a center. That's your weakest position. Because you can have Marcus Smart as your two. You have other guys on the bench that you can go to on the wings and you know the two, three, whatever. You really need a center. Because Ennis Cantor's not very good. Robert Williams has been hurt. You know, Daniel Tice is okay. Uh, you, you don't trust Taco Fall yet. You really need a center. And what Drummond could do for that team, and I think the pick and roll dominance that him and Kemba Walker could have, if I'm Boston, how can you not trade for Drummond? I feel the same way. Honestly, watching that Pistons Celtics game the other night, I was like, Dre's a perfect fit for them. I, I was. I'm like, he fits so well here. This would be great for Boston. This would take Boston to the next level, I feel. The whole thing with Drummond is, right now, he is being asked to do too much offensively outside of his wheelhouse. You put him on a team with, one, a very good point guard, two, three guys that can go and get buckets, and three vocal points of your offense, Brown, Kemba, and Tatum. And you let Drummond run the pick and roll, clean up the glass, focus in defensively, let his defense lead to his offense instead of giving him the ball at the high post and making him create for either himself or for others and posting him up and doing all that garbage and you put him in a system that's actually for a player of his caliber and for a player of his style of play and he's going to look phenomenal. If Drummond gets traded to a good team, I cannot wait to watch the agenda, the narrative around him to flip because he's going to flourish, and all of a sudden it's going to be, oh, Andre Drummond's phenomenal. He's a great player. While when he's been in Detroit, it's he's an overpaid rebounder that doesn't provide anything offensively and is an albatross on defense. If he gets traded to a halfway decent team, I cannot wait for the narrative to flip. If he gets traded to where... 
It's a perfect fit, and I think Boston is the perfect fit for him. I think he's just going to flourish. I think it's going to be, you know, multiple all-star games in a row. He's going to help us take his team to the next level. That's what I see for Andre Drummond. Yep. Going to a system where he fits perfectly, and I can't get off of Boston being the perfect fit for him. I don't disagree. So, the Pistons, between now and the next time we podcast, will play four times. They play in Washington, and then they come home to play Sacramento, Memphis, and Brooklyn. The Pistons have won two in a row. They've got those four games before we pod next. Where are we looking at Detroit being? How do they do over this week? Heck, I, I really think that they're going to drop two of those games. I, I, Memphis is phenomenal right now. Like They're playing very well. John Morant, Dylan Brooks, Jaron Jackson, Jonas Valenciunas. Like, those guys are in a zone. In a zone. I don't see how Detroit goes out and beats them with the way that they're playing. Uh, you know, I think you can beat Sacramento. Sacramento is just a train wreck this year. I think Brooklyn's a toss-up. Yeah, I think Washington's a toss-up considering how Detroit uh, has played against them this year. Obviously, they did beat them once, but they also got blown out by them once. So, you know, I think both those games are kind of toss-ups. I expect Detroit to win at least one of them. But I, I don't, I'm not going to go in there and say they're going to go 4-0. I don't really think they're going to go 3-1. I think they're, they're looking at 2-2 two and two when we come back on the podcast. This one's for Aaron. Anthony Tolliver takes the Pistons to the woodshed. I'm just kidding. Oh, But, wow. no, I think about 2-2 two and two is right. was really disappointed. I think about 2-2 two and two is right. was really disappointed when I saw Anthony Tolliver was traded, and it wasn't to the Detroit Pistons. He got traded to one of his former teams, too, in, in Sacramento. But he didn't get traded to the Pistons. And that is that's my biggest issue with the front office so far. You're not bringing back Anthony Tolliver. Think you about until the trade deadline, or you're gone to Seattle. Think about the mentor, men, mentoring he can provide to Seiko Dumboya. Just think about it, folks. Locker Gosh. room guy, where's Brendan at? <laughs> Locker room Brendan, guy. Brendan, this is your cue. This is for get. you. The <laughs> fact that you didn't jump in right away on that is very disappointing. I'm, you're letting a lot of people who listen down. I'm just glad that you're finally, letting your one fan down. I'm just glad that finally some people are starting to get it. Jesus, I, I I got nothing. Give me one and three on the week. Book it. That's Whoa! Fair. I have no problem with that. One and three, two and two sounds about right to me. So it's gonna settle down. It's gonna settle down. Yeah, this mini hot streak doesn't last. <laughs> you went two games in a row and you were on a hot streak. This is the season for the. That's Pistons. what I'm saying. Don't buy at the trade deadline. My whole point is don't buy at the trade deadline. Well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. In closing, don't forget. Follow at Palace of Pistons on Twitter. Check out the website, palaceofpistons.com. Before you click off this podcast, though, you know, like, rate, review, subscribe to the podcast, whether you're on iTunes or on YouTube, uh, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, you know it, wherever. We're everywhere. We are everywhere. So be sure to you know keep following for the great content. A lot of great videos online and stuff as well. Aaron had a real nice piece. Uh, we had to go up on YouTube about Seiko Dumbuya and um, you know, we continue to put up some real good stuff there. And, you know, we didn't talk enough about Seku on the pod this week and how well he's been playing, but we'll give a shout out to Seku as well. And I guess with that, boys, any other final comments? Good podcast. Um, definitely continue to check out the work that, that we've been doing uh, on the website, palaceofpistons.com. Obviously, the YouTube page, Palace of Pistons. Almost to 1,100 subscribers on there, which is. Great, considering we just passed a thousand, you know, a little over a, a week ago. So, really happy with how you guys have supported us there. Please continue to support us there. Um, you know, the website, the podcast, the YouTube. Follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, all that good stuff. Your support really does truly help us, and it's helping us get to where we want to be here in 2020. Ryan, I'm just happy to be here with my friends, guys. Just happy to be here with my friends. We'll see you next time here on the Palace of Pistons podcast. Thank you.